You boys Patient. ready? Oh, uh, Devin, you're introducing Don John. Oh, wonderful. Cool. Yeah. All right. Three, two, one. Nice. That's it. That's the intro. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the long-awaited 69th episode slash Valentine's Day special. As a matter of fact, I will be uploading this tomorrow on YouTube. So if you're watching this on YouTube, congratulations, you're watching this on Valentine's Day. And what more romantic way than we can celebrate than with sexual addiction? I'm your host, Dean Taylor. Yeah. Joining me tonight is my co-host, Devin King, and a returning guest. Uh, who is this strange motherfucker? Uh, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Yeah, Stephen Beeson. I'm I'm Gross. from uh, call, calling in from <laughs> calling in from Arkansas. Boo. Uh, the, you know the the place Kansas. Yes, yeah, the place that doesn't have all the weird trucker thing going on. Oh, um, right. anyway. Anyways. Sorry, that was. A, I, I'm, I'm sure you got a so handful, low. but they're not the ones uh, protesting. You're not at the, the one. Yeah, yeah, y'all have. Perhaps. Anyway, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, it's so um, weird being no, a Canadian in situations like this. <laughs> is it? Is it not always weird being Canadian? I mean, I mean that's true, but that's coming. If as weird as being American. Taught me, yeah, if taught, if it's taught me anything. You guys have. Little beady eyes. It's that if it's possible. Oh, I'm sorry. About that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I will not hey, confirm guy. nor deny the accurate uh, portrayal <laughs> of uh, South Park. I'm <laughs> not your buddy guy. Yeah, I'm um, not your guy, friend. I'm not your guy. Like it, I'm a Canadian, and those are probably some of the funniest parts of the show. <laughs> like I can never dude, be offended by stuff like that. It, I watch it. I'm like, it's so inaccurate, but that's what makes it so hilarious. It's okay, so I was legitimately going to ask how accurate it was. <laughs> it's not. Like, not even okay. close. Not but even that's close. the point. Like, uh, that's yeah. the point. It's like a whole, yeah. it's a joke. It's making fun of how people <laughs> see Canada yeah. more than anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, this is funny because this was actually my episode idea. We, we do these little... Congratulations! Uh, poll yeah, we, we do these polls where we vote on uh, episode ideas and... You know, the community kind of comes together and it's like, oh, you know, I want to see this one. And uh, this one won. I've actually been <laughs> pitching this one since November because. Uh, no, you know, not November. It's just one of those polls that uh, may get bigger the, the more you participate. Yes. <laughs> the more you nice. stroke the shaft, the harder nice. it gets. Right. So this was. Oh, yeah. There's it, some really difficult episode ideas because they're all too good. Exactly. Yeah, well, and it's it's also funny because I had only seen one of the films that we're talking about, but I thought this Even was after kind all of... this time. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, ever since November, I've seen them all Hack. now. But when oh, I when I have. pitched this idea, I was like, oh, you know, let's let me just Google some films about sex addiction, and uh, wound up being a perfect <laughs> idea for Valentine's Day. So. I hope it was in an incognito window. Could you oh, yeah. say? Would you say it was a nice coincidence? Oh yeah! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, what is let's... the first uh, sexual film we're talking about tonight? Well, f f first I just want to highlight the uh, the the acronym that became nice because I, I I worked quite a bit on that and I had to I had to do some digging in the Laid Google for words that uh that fits so uh what i ended up landing on was nefariously ignominious cinematic experiences i can credit steven for coming up with the cinematic experiences but coming up with the i word was uh tricky and uh if you look up ignominious uh the way it's written there you'll see like the i love when you go on google you see like the etymological kind of history of usage and this just went down like exponentially over time and no one ever uses this word anymore so i'm happy to be bringing this word back for this episode <laughs> well You've it's completed it's also, a historical landmark <laughs> it's also funny because when i pitched this episode idea i pitched it as i don't want to be horny anymore i just want to be happy it's way but, too long of a title like like the meme but we were like no that's too long to fit on spotify yeah. and, and or youtube and then, yeah. And, and then my alternate title was also too long, and it says, Help, I followed and I can't get it up. It just <laughs> it wouldn't fit, on the, it just fit on, the, on, the, uh, on the banner. Oh, it's too yeah. big. The hole's too tight. Well, 
speaking of uh, speaking of too big, let's talk about Michael Fassbender's Wang. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, uh, Ian, and introduce oh, the first film. That tonight. was the best segue we've ever had in the show. <laughs> Thank you. Spoiler alert I'm, I'm... for all three films we're talking about tonight. If you haven't seen them, um, and you want to go in spoiler free for this discussion. Feel free to watch the films and come right back to us. You know, we won't blame you, yes. but uh, I I hope you see two of these films. One of them, yeah, but, you know, we'll get to oh, that. Okay, bit, let's, but... not, let's not spoil our thoughts Yeah, here. that's we're, true. We're I, be... I said eh, that's all. We're, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, Steve McQueen's Shame. Shame, yes. We're going to be talking about uh, Lars von Trier's Nymphomaniac, and we're going to be talking about the uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt indie darling uh don john wait so. you, Nymphomaniac. you know as nice as as nice as this episode is shaping up to me it's a shame that we're not, that we couldn't do my mean mcqueen's episode it ended up being kind of <laughs> broken apart between uh drive fast eat ass and then this and we, we yeah. still haven't talked about bullet yet but that's the other mean mcqueen i wanted to cover so uh we'll make up for it someday. another time maybe we another can discuss time. hunger because that was the first steve mcqueen movie that was it, not particularly successful at the box office, but it was a huge critical darling. Everybody loved it, including mm. myself. So everybody was really interested and excited to see what he'd do next. And it was an NC-17 rated project. Very strange, out there story. Be, because it's sub about something far more simple. And it's simply about the man, played by Michael Fassbender, called Brandon, dealing with a sexual addiction that, you know, he kind of has under control. You know, it's, you know, he mostly keeps it to his apartment. He's very clean and organized, and he thinks he has this addiction under control. But that is until his sister, played by the great Carrie Mulligan, called Sissy, you know, not, not particularly subtle, uh, comes into his, comes literally barging into his life and kind of sends him down a downward spiral, but not quite the way you'd expect. And that's essentially the plot, but. It's kind of like you, what you said, Stephen, with Drive on Drive Fast, Eat Ass. Is, it, yeah. I think there is so much to like the moments of silence and the awkward moments and just the expressions between the characters and how they relate to everything going on around them. That just adds so much context to the story and the emotions that the characters are going through. And I, I'm a little bit biased here because, you know, Michael Fassbender gives me jungle fever and <laughs> this film is in infamously one I'm of my sorry, favorites. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Michael Fassbender gives me jungle fever. Anyways, uh, would, that's would not for Would you elaborate on that? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, all right, let, let me put it this way. I don't way. know how politically correct that is, but he's also a white guy. So that's I don't that, know. that's <laughs> not what I meant. You never heard jungle fever. It basically is like, oh my, to give me the vapors. Yo, okay. that's what Jungle okay. Fever is. It's uh -huh. not a sure. racism sure. thing. That's what it is. Okay. <laughs> just say he's hot. God damn it, yeah. And, 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 and you have to do your, your best Gilbert Godfrey voice when you All say right. it. He's hot. He's hot. Yeah, yeah. All right, let me put it this way. Uh, I'm not a gay man, but uh, <laughs> if I was... But Michael Fassbender is, is Michael Fassbender? Michael Fassbender is Michael Fassbender. But and 20 bucks is 20 I bucks. Do you genuinely yes. believe he is absolutely excellent in this movie? Like, it's some of the best work he's ever done, which is saying a lot for an actor of that caliber. I think we can all at least agree on that, but I also think the rest of the film just has so much to offer. Even if, on the surface, it does kind of seem boring and pointless, but, you know, beneath mm -hmm. the surface, there's so much going on for me, personally. And yeah. Steven, I have an idea of what you think, but Devin, I have no idea what you think about this movie, and I know you just watched it recently, so I want to know your thoughts right now. On shame. Well, I did see it some time ago, and uh, I really felt like I connected to it then. Um, and then after uh, hmm, revisiting it, uh, there was uh, more in it that I that I, uh, I I guess picked up on that I didn't on the first uh, viewing. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, would criticize this film for being kind of empty or shallow just with uh, its presentation. Like, there are these kind of long, unbroken shots that on the surface don't seem to add much. But I do think that that emptiness is kind of the point mm -hmm. in, 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 in uh, understanding his character. You kind of mm. almost project some of the, eh, eh, I, I hear you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just listening. Uh, I hear I'm you. Just listening. All right. Right, Go right. You're, you're... Yeah. But no, no, I, I, I think... 
that this film really does show kind of like the emptiness of addiction and you know the kind of mindset that this person goes into where everything is empty in his life and it's only this compulsion that seems to feed him but then other things kind of complicate that when uh, his sister shows up and suddenly he's having to kind of be in the semi-parental role and he does still care for her but he also doesn't want to like let her in and kind of get those wires crossed yeah uh, there's lots of awkward uh, moments between them that feel very real and I do think that is a terrific uh, film overall, even though it seems uh, shallow. It might seem shallow on its surface. I do think that the realism uh, is quite present in allowing uh, the viewer to kind of see themselves in the character, uh, warts and all. Um, mm -hmm. Steven, what did you think of it? Yeah. Oh, boy. Well. <laughs> so, oh, I want to hear your two stars. I mean, <clears throat> two cents. Uh, um, yeah, right. So, um <laughs> Let me let me talk about the things that I do like about this film. Okay. Um, Michael Fassbender, I will agree with you wholeheartedly that he is a fantastic actor. Um, I was not familiar with this film or with uh, Hunger, but you know I've seen him in uh, Steven Soderbergh's Haywire, which is a film that I love. Uh, obviously, Inglorious Bastards. Um, yeah, I, I think he's a fantastic actor, and uh, Carrie Mulligan, um, I would say, is really the Justice. highlight of this film for me. Um, I haven't even seen Promising Young Woman, and it's mm -hmm. been on my list for a while. I keep putting it off because I, I, I don't know if it's something that would be like for me, but you know, I, I, if anything is convincing me to watch it, it's basically her. And what I liked about this film is that Carrie Mulligan, and I loved her in Drive. Uh, I mean, obviously, I thought she was fantastic in that film. Um, and not to knock her performance in Drive, because, again, I love Drive and I loved her performance in that. But she's very quiet. She's kind of girl next door. Um, she's very cute, He's and, very literally girl next door. Yeah, very wonderful. No, no, exactly yeah. right. But, you know, it, it, in every movie that I've seen her in other than Drive, I felt like I was watching Irene in a way <laughs> because yeah. she's very cute and she's kind of mousy and... Uh, very shy, yeah. Yeah, shy. And so in this, I admired that they gave her more to work with, that she's kind of sexy and mysterious. She's and quite the loud she's mouth got... too. Like it's polar yeah, opposite yeah. to Michael Fassbender, who's very quiet and very calm. And he mm -hmm. only speaks up when he really needs to in the first half. And she's just like always talking and always like putting her emotions out in the open. And seeing mm -hmm. the, those two yeah. like go at it is, I agree. Like that is definitely Yeah, she's like movie. emotionally kind of, uh, she, she puts herself yeah. out there. She's she's on a bash, but she's also kind of dependent and needy in some ways, which uh, which frustrates him. Um, exactly. Yeah, and um, there's some really great cinematography, um, some very impressive uh, camera techniques. Um, I, I There's one scene in particular where they have this, jogging scene and it's a tracking shot and, and they're following no him jogging whatsoever. you see but the yeah. entirety of him jogging too <laughs> yeah no and it's it, that's great i mean when they open on the film he gets out of bed you see the opening title on the bed linens um yeah it's a very artsy kind of well-made you know gorgeously shot film with a handful of great performances and that's kind of what i got out of it, <laughs> um, that's it I, I we've talked about this before with several films and one of which uh was the golden glove where we talked about characters don't have to be likable but they have to be interesting and so mm -hmm. i think about i think about something like and and i'm just you know i mean let's talk about drive because that came out the same year uh that also had carrie mulligan and when i think about drive it is quiet 
it is like this, but there are still moments of dialogue that tell me more about those characters. Like, really? It, it's not, yeah, there are. I mean, even the whole dialogue within the, the pizzeria between Ron Perlman and uh, Albert Brooks, like, What's a Jew doing running a pizzeria? <laughs> no, exactly. And I mean, everybody talks about yeah, that, but funny. it does give something there. And I feel like this film is very empty. I feel like really? I don't even have that much to latch on to. I don't know why I care about Michael Fassbender. I don't know why that, that you I don't should. latch on to it, or is that you don't want to latch on to it and connect with it on in, in, no, in a level it's... that made you reflect on on yourself? That's well, I mean, I I no, it, I mean, it doesn't apply to me really because <laughs> you know I'm not a sex addict, uh, but um, sure that that would imply that I would have to have had sex. No, uh, zing. Um, <laughs> No, but like, is that Zinger self-directed or? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a self-deprecating uh, oh, yeah. thing. Um, exactly. No, but Same it's boat, like, man. it's all good. But but Michael Fassbender is, I mean, I gather that he's a Wall Street kind of banker type. Uh, he doesn't have a ton of dialogue, and and it's like th there is one scene that we get where he's at the, the restaurant with the one girl. And even the things that we learn about him in that brief interaction with, like, he's afraid of commitment. It's yeah. like, it's so surface level. I mean, obviously he's, a, he's afraid of commitment. Like, I don't know. I feel like... But you, you, you're ignoring the conversation he had afterwards, where it's like... What what would you want to? What point in time would you want to live in? And he says like I want to go back in time and I want to be a musician. Like it shows, you know, it tells us that this man is like very nostalgic. Like he probably has fond memories of how things used to be. But I think that's kind of a jaded perspective because just before but that he also he, mentioned he he doesn't want to be where he is. Like he's exactly. very much like jaded and disgruntled, and he's he wants to be anywhere else basically. But where he well, is now, I and that adds so I, I, much. Underst I, I understand that, but again, I, I don't understand why I should even care about him. I'm not even given so much to, to sort of attach Why should to... we care about the driver? You care and about drive. the driver because there are people around him. But there it's the same with Brandon stakes. and Shane. Like, no, it's his it's sister. It's not the same because... His sister, like, you really care about her. Like, the first time she... Like gets into a heated argument, and you can see like Brandon for the first time. The story is like moved by this, and you know we build an emotional connection with her as well. We want to see Brandon change. Yes, but everything sister. about him is he's a terrible, despicable asshole who constantly I don't pushes think so. away. Yeah, I he pushes he people is. away, but there is like a clear, it, it, there's a, like a purposefulness behind it. Like he's afraid to. I, and I don't plenty of people. know that I agree with that. I think that he's just an asshole, and I think I, it's hard to it's hard to root for him or even root against him. Uh, you know, I mean the the film, like the, like I said, there's a lot of impressive shots. There are a lot of there's a lot of impressive cinematography, and at times this film feels like it had more of a cinematography like shot list than it did a script. That's how That's it comes across. It is, so, it is so kind of like fixated on the sort of hollow, you know, art house gleam that it doesn't, it forgets to get me attached to any of these characters. Obviously, I'm attached to Carrie Mulligan, but even that's in that context, but even in that context, like you could take, you know, Michael Fassbender out of this and and make it a movie about her, and I'd be more interested. Like he doesn't add anything to his own story. Yes, he well, he does go for a change though. Like you could see, like a Does clear he? change in his yeah yeah at the end of the movie he gets rid of all of his uh, porn yeah he gets rid of his porn that see, happens like, in the but can, that happens in the beginning though no he doesn't when does he get rid of his porn in the beginning 
when she first gets there, it, it, it's uh, it, no, he, he just hides garbage. it away in his bedroom. He just hides it away. He doesn't straight up. No, throw no, it away. no. He sets the garbage bags on the street corner. That's like a huge moment, and that's halfway through the film. Yeah, and he and at the end of the movie, or even before that, when he's hitting on girls. You know, he's hitting on that girl at the club, and, like, he's, you know, she's clearly with someone. He's trying to hook up with her. We compare that to how he's hooking up with girls earlier, and it's so, like, clean and efficient, and he knows, like, exactly what to say at just the right moment. Well, and see, but here it just was... comes off as, like, desperate and pathetic and sad. Well, and he's we a can, very he's... desperate and pathetic person, but and that's I don't not how it... care what happens to him. That's not I don't... how it's conveyed at the beginning, though. I don't have any connection though. to these people. <laughs> like, well, he's I... desperate and pathetic, but he doesn't come off that way in the beginning. Like he, no, comes, he comes, he succeeds off across as... as very bland, but and I then throughout the that. course of the movie, <laughs> he goes from bland to a desperate and pathetic loser who is a, yeah. a a despicable person to everyone who actually gives a shit about him, and I don't know why they do. No, he uh, well, compa- like Shinji Ikari. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I I don't agree with that. Well, That's interesting. Okay. But and, and I and so I'd like to elaborate uh, why. Like, if there's any scenes uh, you, you sure, want like sure. elaboration on, I'd be happy to be pretentious dickhead and <laughs> explain. Yeah, that. exactly. Well, <laughs> okay, and I'm I'm glad you brought up this scene at the bar because there there's <laughs> there's actually a whole segment there, and this film does something that I think can be well earned, but I also think this film doesn't really earn it. But it has this orchestral score, which is a beautiful score, but it's telling me how to feel. It's sad, depressing music, and it's this swelling piano and this, like, you know, classical sting. And we're watching him, and it's supposed to be like him descending into this dark underworld, and he goes into, like, a gay bar. Or whatever, it's like a gay dungeon or whatever. Oh yeah, it's like and a it's sex portray- dungeon. Yeah, and it's it's portrayed like, you know, this a is like a low point. For I him. don't see it that way. I see the music because think... it played in the beginning too. It played in the beginning where he was at the peak of his addiction, but I and at that point I... we think he's losing the addiction. Like we're getting some false hope that you know maybe he can quit this, but then he just delves into it again and again and again. I think the music right, was meant but, to reflect that thing, nature but, of it and not just oh, we feel bad for him. Like, I don't agree with well, that. Well, no, I don't think that it's necessarily supposed to feel bad. Like, I don't think it's I don't think it's manipulative in that sense. But it is like, it feels like it almost comes across as like, look at him. He's, he's with a, a gay guy. This is the lowest he can go. Oh, I didn't and see that's it that a, way. That's a really weird message to send. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, well, also, it, it might, it might like, be true for his character, but I agree well, that that is a weird like thing to to kind of be well, hung up on. No, and and here's the thing. I mean, up but until the music's that also point, playing when he's paying on that woman, though. Like, it's not just well, a, the gay guy. Like, it's peaking when he's no, no. And you know, I, getting... I understand that, but it's also like up until that point, he could have been like bisexual. I don't know. I mean. I mean, it, it's it's not just that it's it's played so uh, depressingly. Like this is his lowest low. It's just I don't even have a lot of point of reference to this guy to know that it is his lowest low. Right. I understand that because of the music they're playing and because of the the way they're presenting it and the but way they're acting it, too. Like that's everything. Well, yeah, but I, I mean, it's like. It, he could be bisexual. I don't know. I don't have enough to even attach to this guy. Well, I love how it doesn't understand tell us that. What... Like that's exactly what I love about it. I I I see that. Yeah. Um. But like, I don't know, man. And and what really bugged me, and I I, <laughs> I try not to just shit on movies, but this one really bugged me when after the gay bar scene. They have him in bed with these two women and there's like this moment and it's so predictable what you know is going to happen when he gets back to Carrie Mulligan and the music is swelling and there's all these like weird sex faces and it just, I don't know, man, it, it, it just, the whole thing rubbed me 
along the way. And that's, that's fair. Intended. That's fair. Like, this isn't a movie for everyone. Like, not by I any means, so, so I get that. I don't think so. No, I think, that's fair. I don't know. I, I, I wanted to connect with this more than I did. That's totally and understandable. Think, and I, I think that's... Yeah, and I don't think you're just shane on the film either. Like you opened up being pretty positive. Like I'd say that's I did. More positive yeah, than... I, I try to be. Better <laughs> I could be than sometimes. You... Yeah, I tried to be oh. better than you were reviewing The Matrix or. Uh... I was positive to that <laughs> film too. I said it looked. I, hey, I was positive to those films too. Like I said, The Matrix looked I great. Know, I said but... the action scenes were great. Like. I tried yeah. to tell them they weren't. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I don't know, man. It it just. It feels like it wasn't your there was, actually, there was actually a, a review that I read, um, and this was by I'm probably going to butcher this, but his name Marco is uh, Ignati Vish oh. ne Nevetsky of Movie.com, which is a, a streaming service. Uh, they show a lot of Criterion films and a lot of art films, and oh, yeah. this. This, to me, summarized my thoughts. And uh, he says, Shame wears its emptiness like a badge of honor. McQueen is trying for banal blankness. And though he succeeds in that respect, you kind of wish that a filmmaker, and one with a background as an artist at that, would aspire to do more than just say nothing. I don't think he did say nothing. I think there's like it's like Devin said, like it seems like there's nothing on the surface, but there's so much I think going he on. says a lot by saying very little. Exactly. And I think well <laughs> there, 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 there's there's one scene that I think that's pretty uh telling in a lot of this. Um so you know, there, there there's this tumultuous relationship between uh Sissy and her brother, and there's one line where she says, you know, we're not bad people, we just come from a bad place. Yeah. Um yeah. Whether or not that holds up to be like true is uh, up to, up for debate, but it is interesting to see how coming from a bad place can affect how people look for love and longing in their lives and how shallow of a pursuit it can be. But there's this like argument between them um, where she's sitting on the couch and she's watching like cartoons and he's basically just being the very mean spirited projecting a lot of things onto her he sees her as like useless and oh yeah like not not an upstanding member of uh you know society when he's very much not you know he and even mentions yeah. that like she's and, dating like somebody who's married and that could be in reference to the woman he wanted to flirt with on the train at the beginning of the story like there's so and much see, i i almost interpreted that because there is you, you get the feeling that there's uh, some abuse that one or both of them went definitely. through. Yeah, and definitely. and so I I you know I almost thought like is this alluding to some sort of incestuous relationship because you know he walks in like uh, on her in the shower and it's it, it's a very uncomfortable scene that that they don't seem to recognize as uncomfortable. But the film never expands on that in any meaningful way, and I think but that's why like one of. Why does it need to? Like, why does it need to well, expand? On I, I, I I disagree on that because it shows that, you know, his response to seeing a naked woman changes when it's his sister, and it is, you know, like the, 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 there's, like... The, 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 there's a definite difference in how he approaches that, and suddenly he has well, to but, you know, I mean, change he gears, cover up. To, he continues to have the conversation with her while she's in the shower. Yeah. It's like there, there, there's flashes of interesting story. There are flashes of interesting character background and development, and I wish that those were more fully realized. Because okay. as is, I think this is a lot of good ideas loosely strung together and, and put like an art house sheen over it. That that's kind of what it comes across to me is like I don't even know that this is a this is definitely not a narrative film, and I'd argue it may not even be a character film. This is a director film. This is like let me show off all these cool things I can do. I and kind and of it, felt that way just, about Drive. So that's interesting. I know. I think this this is funny <laughs> because my thoughts on this are mirroring yours They've on just Drive. Reversed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's fair. And that is fair. I, I think there's. I I didn't take it as like an incestuous relationship. I took it as 
like they grew up together probably spent a lot of time growing up together maybe their parents were out a lot and you know he i kind of took it as he's done this kind of thing before like even when she was around him as a kid because it's important like, i would imagine was, like, like an abusive father mm -hmm. exactly and you know he wasn't I home very often he was probably that. out late drinking then but uh, okay but let, let let me ask you guys something do, do either of you have siblings i know yes. i know Devin has a brother brother do, and a sister do, okay too. Would you walk in and see that your sister is naked in the shower and continue to have a conversation with her anyway? No, but I don't okay, have a potentially see, abusive no. father and a rough well, upbringing like, like I mean, these look, characters I, do. I didn't have a great relationship with my father either, but I, you know, there's something very deeply uncomfortable about that. Even and and again, we're 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 extrapolating on this, and and the film isn't clear about it. And it's like there's so much here that I think if it was just expanded on a little bit, I could maybe resonate with it more. But it's so it's just it, it's empty. And I, I don't know if I agree that it's deeper than its surface. I, I just I don't know. I, I really struggled with this one. I think this is a film not about like sexual addiction, but just addiction in general. I think there's. You know, there's a reason he goes to a bar to pick up women. There's a reason he, you know, does cocaine before having his fresh new sexual experience, which that could be taken as, like, kind of a thing of addiction. It's like, I'm trying this new part of this drug or alcohol I haven't tried before to bring me happiness, and it just never does. Like, this reminds me a lot of Eyes Wide Shut, where, like, the sex is, like, very cold and awkward in contrast of how it's usually, like, presented in Hollywood to kind of show their audience, like, look, like, this isn't something you want to take a part of every day of your it, life. Like, this is how... It, it's also, like, it shows it how is. he really can't, like, get it up when there's an emotional connection. It almost has to be shallow for him for it to be effective, and that's just what his addiction is going to dictate. Yeah. It's like when he gets together with the one girl, he just can't make it work out, but then he immediately calls up some, you know, hooker, and then and and goes into full exhibition mode. Exactly. So, it, yeah. it shows kind of the contrast of where he he just he's emotionally shallow, but like viscerally kind of compulsive, and mm -hmm. and I do think the film does reflect that. Yeah, and I've met so many people with addictions that are just like that, that just like I it, I have this void in my life, and this is the only way I could be happy. Like that's why, you know, that one sex scene near the end where. You know, he's having the freesome and it's these golden lights and this like cheery music. It's because he's like, you know, finally, like I found my purpose in life. But, you know, the moment is fleeting. Like it doesn't last very long. And in the very next scene, he's dealing with the tragic near loss of his sister. And just the build up on the elevator and like the actor's like emotional responses mm -hmm. was so effective. Like it's it earns it's like long take during that sequence. Like it earns like the time it's building up to that. And I think it is very much intentional that you do see it coming. Like, there's, they plant that in the story where she's looking down the ele the train, and he's like, stop fucking around, like, what are you doing? Or later, but where James it, Batch it, Dale is, like, looking at her almost, arm. Sorry. It, it borders on almost parody in a little bit, because they're oh. kind of drag. It feels like they're dragging it out. It feels... And I mean, but that's look, what makes I it understand. so effective. Like, if you... If <laughs> somebody know, was I mean, hurt... And you were waiting to hear back what happened to them, and they wouldn't answer their phone or anything. Like, how would you feel? And I feel like this visual storytelling kind of mimics I, how you'd feel in a moment of tragedy. I mean, look, I'll, I'll say this. I think Requiem for a Dream does what this film is trying to do. I think it portrays various different it, forms it does it of addiction. It in a different way, but... But it, it does have an art house polish... But it also communicates just enough about the characters to get me invested, it's and I don't for think a different this approach film for that, did. though. Like well, it's I still understand, great, but I, it's still like my second favorite Aronofsky film. But it, it's going for a different handling of the subject matter, just like this film's a different mm. handling of the. Yeah, subject like Requiem's a very kind of stylish in your face, but very also. Visceral. Yeah, yeah, vi visual kind of experience, and it, and it shows four people kind of all going through different forms of addiction, where this is just one person, basically, and you see it kind of more or less played in real time, and so that's kind of the difference, where, yeah, I, I, 
like I, I get the comparison between those films, but I think um, Requiem just compacts like four different stories into one, where this is just kind of one played out more or less in real time. So I wouldn't say one is better than the other for that, but no, I, 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 I but it, it, it is just to compare those two different kind of approaches to showing the you know the downfalls of addiction. But I mean, because if it they're... wasn't like working for you, I get how that moment would kind of piss you off. So yeah, yeah. Like it's like it, it, it. You're not really buying into the story, so the emotional beats don't really work. Like I get that wholeheartedly. Like yeah, I feel that no, way about I, quite a few films we talked about on here. I yeah no. I mean I I get that. You you know this isn't. Uh, <laughs> it's still not you know quite as uh, emotionally manipulative as uh, you know drived across con- or dragged across concrete, which I loved. Like I I understand. Or our next that, movie. <laughs> yeah, right. I appreciate things movie. about that movie too. But. Um, but yeah, I I just like I said, I really wanted to connect with this more, and it just it it bordered on parody at some point. It it felt like like there's legitimately moments in this that I thought were like comedic when they're having this orchestral score. And he's making these sex faces, and it's like, oh no, my sister committed suicide. It is just so. It, it, he's it's not thinking like, about that. Just, how could you have done that. this? How could you have committed suicide? I can't. <laughs> believe I cannot suicide. believe you believe you committed. I can't help you out of this one, <laughs> sissy. <laughs> I can't help you out. Of the, I can't help you out of this one, sissy. After the person died, yeah, I can't help you. Out yeah, of this, one. this is. It was so like, just come on, you know. Yeah, it wasn't the only uh, Nathan you were hoping enough. for, and I get that. That's fair. <laughs> so That's pretty reasonable. Uh, do, do we want to? Do we? Do we want to review this? I have uh, one final question before we get into the thoughts, and that is the ending. Uh, Gentlemen, do you think Brandon decided to sleep with the girl at the end, or not? I don't care. Um, no. Devin! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't give a shit about this guy. I, I, you know, his sister deserves better. How about that? Devin, um, what do you think? <laughs> that's a fair point. Ah, uh, I don't know. I haven't really thought about whether or not he does. It just, <laughs> just kind of like... lingers on in that moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's not really the point of the ending either. The point is we just, like, is he going to continue to spiral again for the first time? We, like, we just don't know. And that's what Probably makes it so effective. Probably because way it he's ties a in... terribly insufferable person. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and so is the characters in the next movie. Oh, final boy. thoughts on shame <laughs> uh, a five out of ten that's actually not as bad as I was expecting to be honest uh, I was I was gonna go lower and the more that I think about it the lower it gets but you caught me on a good day at least so like, <laughs> five well, out I'm out. glad what about you I'll, I'll give it I'll give it a lukewarm 7.5 okay oh fair enough you missed an opportunity there. <laughs> oh, don't worry. It's coming up later. <laughs> okay. um, full bias here. Uh, <laughs> this film is like one of my favorites. It's you know, it's not for everyone. I get that, but I think there is so much going on beneath the surface, and it it just I don't know, man. This film just really hits me where I live. I can't even really put my finger on why that is. So, um, it, it backwards the inversion of a six point nine with a nine point six out of ten. It's wow. one of my favorites. Wow. Yeah, it's one of my favorites, That's man. up there. Full bias. Uh, it's yeah. even in my honorable mentions on my best of list, so, which was maybe a bit of a spoiler on Letterboxd before we even started this discussion. So, <laughs> yeah, take that as you will. But, yeah, I, wow. I don't know, guys. Uh, fair enough. Full bias. Fair, <laughs> full bias. Fair, fair enough, yeah. And, my, and Michael uh, Fassbender it, makes me question my sexuality. Moving on. Definitely moving on. Uh, let Speaking me... of questioners, expressioning your sexuality. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Devin, this is something Nymph? you'd like to say? <laughs> uh, no, Lark... no, I'm not, I'm not saying <laughs> anything. Uh, Lark, not yet. You're waiting till we get to uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt or. Uh... No. <laughs> Just introduce the damn movie. No. <laughs> okay. we're, we're waiting for Stone uh, Skark Skirt, obviously. Sorry, go on. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, Lars von Trier's <laughs> Nymphomaniac is a two-part European erotic art film 
written and directed by Lars von Trier. The film stars Charlotte Gainsborough returning from Antichrist and Melancholia, the two other films in von Trier's Depression trilogy. Mm-hmm. Um, also featuring Stellan Skarsgård, Stacey Martin, Shia LaBeouf, and Christian Slater with some cameo appearances by Uma Thurman. Uh, Willem Dafoe, and uh, favorite of the podcast, Mr. Udo Kier. So, uh, what is Second for about? Norm MacDonald for most appearances on the podcast. <laughs> <Even> basically. <laughs> uh, Letterbox told me that uh, Udo Kier was my most watched actor of the year. That doesn't surprise wow. me. Wow. What a chad. Um, this film is about a young woman named Joe who is found beaten and lying in an alleyway behind the apartment of Seligman, who is played by Stellan Sarsgaard. And uh, it's about these two people from very different backgrounds. Um, uh, Joe is a self-proclaimed nymphomaniac who is dealing with sex addiction, and she is recounting the story of her life to Stellan Sarsgaard or Skarsgård Seligman, who is a middle-aged, uh, asexual, you know, man who who lives by himself, and they have a very mature and intellectual conversation and try to come to terms uh, with what what her life was like and. Uh, Seligman is, you know, trying to understand and compare these sexual deviancies to things that he might understand, like like fly fishing. And <laughs> it's a it's a five hour uh, edgy boy, uh, somewhat pretentious film. Uh, so, <laughs> you, you, just... you, you, you're right about the edgy boy. So I I want I want to say this. So this yes, is one of those please. films. Uh, like other Von Trier's and other more contemporary words that I have, it's been on my radar and it's been in, and it has intrigued me just from the premise and the um, content uh, for a while. But I've either been either too insecure in myself or just chicken shit to actually <laughs> watch and check it out. Probably a combination of the two. So, uh, us getting to this was definitely uh was definitely a long haul. It was a bit of a hike, but I did see back um in the day breaking the waves and also dancer in the dark by von trier and i enjoyed those films upon my first viewing when i saw dancer in the dark the second time though i just couldn't help but notice the very subtle and not so subtle ways that he would very intentionally emotionally manipulate the audience which really pissed me off uh, upon second viewing um (laughs) watching this film getting into it i was uh, delightfully surprised that majority of the content of it is this very adult mature intellectual conversation like it seemed to be more explorative than exploitive um which is uh what was quite a contrast and what i was led to believe and i was actually rather surprised like wow von Trier really matured over the years and then i saw part two um (laughs) (laughs) yeah and um specifically the ending of part two specifically the ending the last minute the last fucking minute of this movie uh, uh-huh. Is the thing is a thing that kind of <laughs> confirmed all my suspicions all along, where uh-huh. he hasn't become any less of an edgy boy over the years. He's just gotten better at edging, um, especially <laughs> the audience. Yeah. Where I, I'm just going to spoil the ending. Uh, Seligman, who is happy uh, and is is an asexual character, apparently was lying the whole time because he starts to try to uh, sexually um, molest her after she basically was uh, saying, you know, I've I've uh, overcome my nymphomania and I just want to live the celibate life. And then he just starts trying to violate her. And he says, but you've had sex with lots of men. And I'm like, fuck you, Von Trier. Like, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I was she, saying it, I was saying it throughout the whole thing. Like every five minutes, I was like, God damn it, Von Trier, for just pushing well, the envelope she, ever she so also, slightly. Time. She also pulls a gun on him, shoots him, and runs out of his building. So it's, yep. it, it, it's very... Uh, it's very on brand. So it's very film <laughs> school student ending. Like let, my mouth was just me... a gape for how badly delivered that ending was. And it's even worse in the original cut, but in the director's cut, it's really not much better. 
So. Oh yeah, I I, 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 I subjected myself to the director's cut thanks to uh, Steven's <laughs> yeah, suggestion, thanks for that. which yeah. turned this four-hour Odyssey into a five-hour fucking hours. Odyssey. Yes. Yes. So uh, <laughs> let me let me give a little background. Uh, I have seen uh, Melancholia. I have seen Antichrist. I've now seen Nymphomaniac, and I have now seen, uh, or I have seen, uh, The House That Jack Built. So I haven't explored uh, his earlier works. I, I still have uh, Breaking the Waves and, you know, The Idiots and Dancer in the Dark um, to see, but I have a pretty good understanding of, uh, of Von Trier and his contemporary work, at the very least. And I think that something, and 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 I know Ian is going to disagree with me, but <laughs> spoilers. I think that uh, yeah, spoilers. Um, I think something that Von Trier does very well um, is he loves to challenge the art of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Back in uh, two thousand three, he made a documentary film called "The Five Obstructions." And I would highly recommend this to anyone that is interested in filmmaking, because the story is that there was a a friend and mentor of uh, Von Trier named uh, Jorgen Leth. And uh, Leth had made a film called The Perfect Human, which Von Trier uh, loved. And so the idea is that Von Trier challenged this friend of his this this uh mentor and idol to remake the film five different ways and throughout the course of the film it's you know okay you have to remake your own film but you have no set you have no shot lasting longer than 12 frames or you have to remake the film but it's animated this time. And and so that, to me, I mean, even with Dogville, which has been on my list for a while, um, that is a period piece that, you know, Von Trier thought, well, okay, what if I just made this uh, village, this period piece village into, like, this closed set? And it's all, like, you know, set design it's instead like of... Play. Yeah. Yeah, trying to film on location and have these period accurate buildings or, or period accurate whatever. And so I think that while you know Von Trier would probably like to think of himself as Tarkovsky, um, I think that there's a lot <laughs> of Jean Luc Godard in what he's doing. Oh, where he's explicit. really fascinated with deconstructing filmmaking not really just on a narrative level but like filmmaking itself he wants to know why are we doing it this way and the other half of that is you know why why do you guys think the way you do i think that he's Mm -hmm. someone that is fundamentally curious and i think he knows that he is the odd man out and rather than like presenting it in a way that's like oh man i'm like so i mean and there is some of this where it's like oh man i'm so edgy look at this he really (laughs) wants to tap into why is this edgy you know and i think i think there is something fascinating about that this this is part of what has intrigued me about von Trier for a while but also what pushes me away is um he almost yeah. uses that fascination of deconstruction against you as the audience. Like when that ending before that had ending happened, I I thought to myself, what's the worst possible thing he could do to end this? <laughs> and then he does it, and I'm sure. like, well, fuck. And, and then he does it. So, and <laughs> yeah. on, on the one hand, he has a point, and it's and 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 there's something to be said there. But on the other hand, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's kind well, of funny. It's... That's I, I gotta go real quick because that is. Exactly how I feel about him. Yes, it's good to be clever. Yes, it is good to have fun deconstructions of cinema. However, there it's a two-way street for me. You know, like you can deconstruct cinema and still make a compelling story, <laughs> a compelling narrative. But my problem with Von Trier is that he doesn't really make movies to make movies anymore. 
He makes movies as vessels for deconstruction and the voice's own <laughs> political beliefs, essentially. I like, don't th know that I'd agree with I with That's that exactly far. how this movie felt to me. Like, it's just the whole time, it's like there's no consideration for making a compelling story. It's all just trolling the audience and making fun of the audience and... Uh, you know, well, Stellan Skarsgård's character like trying to overanalyze the story and make Charlotte Gainsbourg being like, no, that's that's not how it works. It's like, oh, I get it, Von Trier. You're making fun of audience members that you know overanalyze your movies. Ha ha. That's well, hilarious. but you know what? I I, I think there were using... some genuine nice moments in there where he is being like, I think he's a little too honest for his own good in in some cases, but I do think that there are some genuine kind of vulnerable, sweet moments that were depicted here. Like, I'm trying to think of some specific examples. But... <laughs> You're trying to think of some, yeah, exactly. But well, no, like there there, there 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 were some moments like that though that I felt throughout where I felt genuine connection well, to the material of what's and going I will on. Will say, and I mean, I I, I know. <laughs> I know Ian will take this to the extreme, but <laughs> like I, I do agree in some ways that he is voicing his own sort of opinions and grievances. But what you have to understand is a lot of his characters and the things that he's presenting, he's presenting them. He always has a character who is somewhat representative of his critics. <laughs> and that's honestly fascinating to me because I think Seligman is is supposed to be an embodiment of the people who criticize his own work. Exactly. And there's one. Well, OK, but not saying that's a bad thing, but there's one scene that I think was particularly brilliant. And I think it worked in this context where Seligman is describing to the character Joe, um, you know, that he's like this good, you know, liberal upstanding man. And, you know, he doesn't want to hear about this violent act that she has to perform on herself, which is shown in great detail. And the, the abortion scene. And she makes the point to him well, how can you support something? How can you say that you're this, you know, uh, you know, feminist and, and you believe in all this when you can't even hear the details? Oh, that was so stupid, uh, though. It, well, is it stupid or is it making a big point here? Like, is yeah. there something deeper to that? I but think it comes there out of nowhere. Like, like, your character doesn't strike me as someone that would do that. That's my problem. Is that he always, like... and you know, pointing out that, like, the critic is, like, representative of the people criticizing this work, that's exactly what bugged me, is, like, all these characters are just deconstructions and Loris von Trier's opinions about the world and <laughs> voicing them for all these different characters, but the whole time I was just thinking, like, you were ashamed, like, where's the part where I should care? Where's the part where I should give oh, a shit man, about any know. of these characters? Because I feel like I knew just as much I feel like I knew just as much about that. the main character as I did at the end, as I did in the beginning. I felt like I just wasted my time. I felt like I learned nothing about her because well, the film would so rather talk I, I, about I, you know, fishing I, I for five like minutes I because there's a random my fishing <laughs> line on the fucking I, wall. You know what? I felt like if I, I w didn't have... Mm, I felt like I didn't... Ha wouldn't have wasted my time if it weren't for the last fucking minute of this whole movie. Yeah, and <laughs> I get what he's saying. Like, which, which I think was was his point. He his goal was to piss me off, and it worked. Yeah. Um, but because he throws basically five <laughs> hours of character development out the fucking window to show how much of a hypocrite his uh, critics are, I guess if that's the uh, metaphor you want to go for. Well, like... okay, so so th <laughs> this is. This is like uh, that quote that, you know, Tarantino described, where it's like people go to a Tarantino film and they expect something. You don't go to Metallica and ask them to turn the music down, you know? And sure. I feel like Von Trier is playing very on brand. And if you notice, this film um, has an eight-act structure between the two parts, um, Melancholia has five acts, and Antichrist has five acts, mm. and, you know, the five obstructions. Like, this is clearly, like, this is very on-brand, and I think if you're familiar with his 
I don't agree more with that. Co- I don't. I, I think if you're familiar with his contemporary... But Melancholia familiar... didn't feel like that to me at all. It felt like a story. It felt like characters I could emotionally connect with that were dealing with a very serious issue. Like, I connected with the characters in Breaking the Waves, even. Like, that was, like, a very simple story. You know, it wasn't five hours long. It wasn't delving well, into all these different <laughs> political themes. Well, it was I just a story is, about a I close group of characters is... that go for an arc that change. And this is just sure. nothing. And I don't, I don't know that I would recommend this as an entry point to Von Trier. Well, it wasn't uh, for I, that. I... <laughs> yes, yeah. for, for love of God, no. <laughs> but I, I, I think that there's something here that I, I don't know. I, I, I think there's something genius about what he's doing, even when it doesn't quite work. And I actually, like, like even when, th- like, there's moments that might not work, I feel like the bulk sum of this movie works well. That's fair. Um, and I think, you know, it's it, it's kind of interesting because, um, like, this film... Like the first part one felt very much like you were describing about Eyes Wide Shut. I thought of it more as a deconstruction of sexuality in and of itself. Yeah, that part I appreciate. Where it's like it's cold and it's distant. Mm -hmm, Very awkward. Talking about all of these different sexual kind of ideas and philosophies and stuff, but none of it is particularly erotic. No. That's no. There, 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 there was very little arousal on my on my end. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I liked part one, but I think part two felt like the movie he wanted to make, or the movie that I was more See, familiar with. I thought part with. two was even uh, part worse. one is where I gained respect for him. Part two is where well, he throws it out of the fucking see, window. <laughs> I, was, I was in the opposite because I really liked part two more, but I'm also more familiar with his contemporary work. Yeah. You know so, what you're I mean, getting into, and you're kind of this is like you going back to that um, abuse clinic that she signs up for. Where, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, like, I even what, got what, sick. What, 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 what the fuck is that place? Is that like, hey, sign up for voluntary domestic abuse? Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's basically <laughs> what mean, that. But there's so is. much in the films yes. that felt like that. There's so many moments where I'm like, this is not how any of this works, Lars von Trier. Like the weird like sex club that they have. It's like this weird group where they like. Do they like sing or have an opening speech before like every meeting? It's <laughs> like, like that's not how a, any of this works. No, it's an addiction. <laughs> is there is there aftercare? It's or, it's not an addiction group. It's just like when they're younger and they're just like, okay, how many oh, guys can that. we fuck in a week? Like, what the fuck was that? And there's so much <laughs> stuff in the like, movie like that where it's like you have no really? idea how any of this works. <laughs> It's like, like show up anywhere know. between two and six a.m. and here's your made up name and here's. Yeah. Uh, all the ways I'm gonna make your 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 life miserable. Yeah. I, I, I I don't know. I I did like. Uh, there, there's a point in this where it becomes like almost like a crime film, and she has to be a dominatrix for the mob. Oh yeah. And I was like, oh yeah. Oh, that? oh shit. Like this is. Well, see when that happened, it's so I was like, goofy. Oh, <laughs> no, it's not goofy because when they got to that part, I was like, oh shit. Now we're getting to Von Trier. Like the first, but, the first but, half of the, this. The first half of the movie was I, 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 as normal. As if this wasn't Von Trier enough. It was as no, normal no, as Von Trier could like be. The and then it's just like, it's yeah, it's first... a dominatrix game. Like, it's so goofy. All of a sudden, dis- out of nowhere. I disagree. I, I think this is a, <laughs> it was this like, is a nice as new challenger as listening yeah. in. Um, yeah. <laughs> he's been a, a silent listener for a while. Daryl, I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, what's your take on this film? And what do you think of our thoughts so far? Yeah, I'm sorry, Daryl. Guys, yeah, no worries. I uh, I came in late. I actually had was plans tonight, but they got uh, changed. So hey, it all works out. Um, I don't know. I'm mainly just all? echoing what uh what Ian and uh Devin were kind of saying. Of like, I think the movie is more than enough Von Trier. I don't think you can justify that the way he ends it as like an expectation when the movie has been nothing but the expectation I yeah. had for it in a weird way. Like it just kept being that film. So I don't think this, the, you know, I guess sure. You know, the, the main dialogue between the two isn't like too extra for most of the time. It's, it's, you know, in a, a plain sit down kind of thing. So taking that to the next level, you could say sure. But like, 
I don't know. It it feels very, you know, like I've mentioned before, it's very related to like religious allegories and to the point where like I, I feel like the bloating of both I mean, I haven't even seen the director's cut asterisk, but like the bloating of like this long five hour thing just feels like, you know, akin to almost a comment on like the Bible's unending length and it's like, you know, it's got tons of the sexuality and violence that people, you know, don't really relate to the Bible, but it's all there. So I feel like Von Trier is doing his Von Trieriness throughout. I don't, I don't know. The the way it ends has never sat well with me like years after seeing it. <laughs> and it's just one yeah. of those moments where kind of like Devin said, I, I think throughout he had earned a, a layer of respect for me and it was really, you know, just, just ripped away like the skin on an old soup. Like it was just torn yeah. away and, Oh yeah, that's, that's the movie. <laughs> that's and, that. uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. but like, you know, I, I do really, in a weird way respect the guy he's a very incredibly visual like i know you've noted before i don't know if you mentioned it already but like he's one of the few that really believes in the tarkovsky sense of like visually you tell it and then you know oh if i didn't say this well you know you could have interpreted it from my very dreamlike obvious imagery you dialogue, know and, and yeah. you can lean on that as a crutch sometimes which i think he does mm -hmm. you know he, it's his third leg is that crutch um oh, i Nice. This, this is what's fa this is what's fascinating to me about this is like when I heard that he dedicated the Antichrist to Tarkovsky, like I haven't seen the film, but I've known enough about Von Trier and uh, his messaging. Like I found that kind of laughable when I first heard it. When they were having this like intellectual philosophical kind of discussion, it was reminding me a lot of the dialogue in Stalker or Solaris. I'm like, okay, maybe this uh, his uh, fa you know fascination or influence from tarkovsky is more warranted than i imagined like this actually feels like a tarkovsky kind of movie in a modern sense with them having this back and forth kind of dialogue and there is no kind of conclusive answer to the stuff they're just it's a morality kind of dialogue and that's the stuff that i found really fascinating with this film and how he was drawing parallels between fly fishing and the fibonacci sequence and all this to uh, her sexual deviancy, <laughs> which she's also very self-critical of. Like this is what I really appreciated in part one, and found it more of a an exploration rather than an exploitation of the stuff. And then part two happens. Yeah, right. <laughs> it. Yeah, I, I, the ending wouldn't even bug me so much if it was executed in an interesting way, but it really feels rushed to me. Like it's like he didn't know how else to do it, so he saw it uh, end it. So it's like. It kind of feels like a bad film school ending where it's like, uh, oh, uh, this character wasn't who they said they were. Character pulls out a gun out of nowhere, shoots them, and leaves. It, bada bing, bada boom, the end. <laughs> like, it's so unsatisfying. Like, like five dollars about us to die. That's the best you could do. Yeah, exactly. Like, it feels just like imagine it if, uh, like, Lord of the Rings, like, you know, he goes to the bed and then out of nowhere, you know, Samwise goes to kiss him. He just kills him. Like, you know, it just like, <laughs> yeah, like exactly. it's, it, it kind of ruins well, the five man. hours you've yeah, just spent with these just, two I mean, characters. Or just, I executed in a more okay, interesting like, way it, than that. You know, it, it's like, <laughs> it's yeah, I, I, I had the real ring in my backpack the whole time. And yeah, then he kills yeah. Samwise. And yeah. then Frodo <laughs> just goes on a killing spree. Exactly. The end. Well, and, that and, was... That would actually be awesome. I would. I would probably. Prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> we fixed it. Yeah, yeah we fixed it. We Return of the King. Congrats, guys. I, I, like, if you're gonna um, shock the audience, probably, at least hey, that ending well. will probably be better than whatever the Amazon Lord of the Rings turns into. <laughs> oh no, I don't disagree. Uh, well, um, that. <laughs> or, 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 or imagine like Star Wars Episode Three, where it turns out uh, Obi Wan was a Sith the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> Out of nowhere, well, it, yeah, with it, just as much. Again, I, I go back to the fact, like, I, I mean, I know Devin hasn't seen it, but I think I know at least Daryl has seen it. Do you think that the ending of this is any less manipulative or more manipulative than something like Antichrist or something like Melancholia? Melancholia felt way more earned. Yeah, and, Melancholia and really sticks its landing. Yeah, and mm. really well do, constructed. Do you think Antichrist though? I, I haven't seen Antichrist tapped out outside halfway the opening. Through, so I okay, haven't seen the fair. ending of Antichrist. <laughs> I was really young. What, I think I was yeah, like What, a, what about uh, House the Jack Built? Uh, that was the best part of the movie. <laughs> and I the was kind of mixed yeah. on that movie overall. It was really yeah. funny. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I I, I, I think... You, and again, I, if there's a build-up to it. You know the moment is coming. Like, here, sure. it just feels like it came out of nowhere. It's like, oh, I gotta be shocking edgy for no reason. It's like, no, just make a compelling ending. 
you know, we've had five hours of build-up. I need something a little bit more than this, because that was what was keeping me on for Volume 1. It's like, okay, like, I, I really don't like this, but there's something here. There's just something here. The story at least concludes in a satisfying <laughs> way. I could maybe be gratified. Like, it may have, it could well, make a journey worthwhile, and it just I, didn't. I don't, I, 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 I don't think that, I don't think this is Von Trier's best. But as a fan of Von Trier... Might be his worst. I, I had, well, I don't think it's his worst, either. I don't, I don't think it's his worst. I mean, I would, I would argue that... <laughs> Maybe the idiots could be up okay, there well, or something. Seen that that yet, so. Maybe, and I haven't even seen that yet. But the the premise does not really sell me. Um, <laughs> but but you know, it's it's. I don't think it's his best. I don't think it's his worst. But as a fan of Von Trier, I I had a good time with it. Fair enough. And even with the ending, I I did. I saw it coming. I knew it was going to happen. Um, and I kind of appreciated the just dark irony of it. I, I just kept thinking to myself, what a mad lad. <laughs> but that's exactly <laughs> what it is. Watching this movie was like sitting down and having a very in-depth and intellectual discussion that was very revealing. And you're able to be like vulnerable and kind of talk about things that you otherwise wouldn't be comfortable kind of mentioning but you really felt like there was some catharsis and just talking about it and getting it all out there. And then you go to shake the guy's uh, hand at the end of the night, and he tells you to snuff his finger after he just stuffed it up his ass. Like, that's what this, <laughs> watching this film felt like. That's a good – that, that is, is the best probably review the, we've had. That's probably the best review we've had, and that, that well is done. part of why I loved it. I'm so glad uh, we got that live. <laughs> <laughs> Cut out the last minute, and this is a great film. Fair enough. Okay. Totally uh, so I want to say things I like about it. Like, I don't want to just trash on the film. Um, uh, like, most yeah, of the okay. performances are good. Uh, yeah, like, the most of the cast is pretty solid. Like, Stellan Skarsgård in particular, is, he's such a good actor, and he really, really tries to make the dialogue work. Charlotte Gainsbourg is, like, I think she's a singer. She's not really an actress, but, man, Lars von Trier definitely gets a lot out of her in this movie yeah. and definitely I, I have Melancholy. to give her a lot of props for a putting up with his shit and b putting herself out there yeah uh, i appreciate all the actors to... putting themselves out there for this yeah. mo maniac <laughs> because spoilers <laughs> the sex is all real like it's all actual sex on top of that okay so i <laughs> i did want to bring this up really briefly so they had porn doubles and they had prosthetic genitals on this film so that's not actually. It's not one hundred percent true, but well, it's not. It's not Charlotte Gainsborough, and it's not Stacy Martin. What it, they did it's is not like Shia I saw. I saw. I, I didn't saw see a Charlotte Dick. They they did interviews where they talked about that they would have people come in with like special effects markers, and it was like marking the parts that would be green screened for the porn doubles. Oh, and how hot it was to wear prosthetic genitals and and yeah there, there's a lot of dedication that went into something like this and to make and, sure that everyone was comfortable and you know yeah, like i appreciate closed that too set. like all the actors and, 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 yeah yeah, yeah. To, to give them credit it looks pretty seamless like i, I didn't notice any vfx kind of artifacts from any of that i mean some of the close-ups did look a little uh silicone now that you mention it yeah right um, so <laughs> Yeah, so I I, I I can tell, but I commend them for trying to approach the subject matter in a way that makes the uh, cast comf relatively comfortable with it. Um, mm, yeah. Although they, they they certainly were weren't afraid to bear all. Well, uh, in, in, actually, in many scenes. And and actually, Shia LaBeouf was so determined to get this project. He was so dedicated that his audition was just he mailed Von Trier a sex tape. Yep. So, <laughs> also, uh, he, he was anything but shy. Yeah, exactly. Can we talk about uh, Shia LaBeouf in this movie? Oh yeah, his uh, <sighs> I, I, uh, Australian Irish American accent. What? Uh, what a, was he channeling for that accent? Oh my God! Why did they give Christian Slater a British accent? What? I, why? Like most of the acting is pretty solid, but those two actors were 
fucking awful. Like I couldn't believe I how disagree, bad they were. I disagree. I disagree on Christian Slater. I, I thought he was Christian so Slater, over the top, man. I don't know. <laughs> I thought he held his own, and I thought I that know. when he was giving the performance, when he was, you know, essentially he had lost his mind. He was having some like was so funny. hemorrhaging on <laughs> on the brain or something. I don't even know, but I, I I thought he managed to pull it off well. I'm I'm a fan of Slater. Yeah, me uh, too. Like him. I love him in Mr. Robot and yeah. True well, Romance. I, I've, but this I've ain't been it, Chief. I've of him since True Romance. Yeah. I, so, I, I have to give a quick shout out to my favorite performance in this. It's from two actors where I didn't, I didn't understand a single word they said, but the two uh, <laughs> the, the two guys that she brings in because she wanted to try experimenting with someone with, with people she had no language in common with. Uh, the way they communicated was hilarious. I have to say, with the, with the tongue clicks and you know just. <laughs> Figuring I, I, out the logistics of that scene. Uh, yeah, I got. I don't know. I, 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 I found it really funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, got, and that's yeah. part of that's part of Von Trier too. Is like when I was watching that, and you know, she she starts like looking at these guys through the window. I'm like, oh no, this is this is going to be one of those things that's going to turn into something racist. And oh, like this is gonna be edgy. This is gonna be this is gonna be too dark. Like not a joke, but like this is gonna be. He's gonna go too far. And then they play it out, and it's actually you know rather. I mean, for the most part, respectful. It's not. It's not like she's fetishizing them because of their skin color. It's just you know she wants these people who she can't even understand because she's dealing with this trauma. And and she wants to feel that vulnerable in this in this sexual position, and you're like, oh my god, you know, this is really like, this is know. this is really great, and this is really thoughtful, and it's actually deep, and and then like a minute later, she's throwing around <laughs> racial slurs and and <laughs> like uh, complaining about people who are politically correct, and I I think that that's almost part of the genius but it's also part of the the worst of von trier is yeah. this constant like <laughs> i just gotta be edgy and, man well it's it's not even that it's like i i remember hearing chris stuckman talk about the uh the time that he went to see the house that jack built at one of these film festivals he had been invited to and he said that there were people walking out and he was talking to them and being like, you know, are you okay? Like, what's going on? And they're like, yeah, I love Von Trier, but I just needed a minute. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're almost in a, a masochistic relationship with this guy, you know? And I think that's very fitting for this film because you, you love his work, but you, you're, you're almost torturing yourself with his edginess. And and I think it's his brand, so it's just it works too much for, for me. It, it works for me, but I understand how it doesn't work for yeah. a lot of people. I, it came at the expense of the story. Like that's my biggest problem with it is that it came at the expense of the story and the emotions behind it. Where I didn't feel that way with Behind the Waves and Melancholy at all. I didn't even realize like how janky like the editing style in either of those movies were. Mostly because I was probably just invested in the story and the characters, and I just didn't know this. But here, I feel the like editing's I... bad. I'm sorry, man. Lawrence von Trier edits his films poorly. I know a lot well, of people try to defend his it... editing style. I well, I disagree. Well, now, I respectfully disagree. I, 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 I feel is like doing it yeah. to piss you off. Exactly, I, I but that's why he makes movies. Just make a movie. It works. <laughs> it, it works. But, but I, I think the way he splices in um, the Ramstein song on *Nymphomania*, <laughs> apropos to the Eddie Bauer thing, where he has this very slow, beautiful kind of uh, contemplative opening, where it's just the sound design and the images of this. I really like this kind of uh, bare alleyway area that she finds herself in, where it's just brick. And yeah. water and decay, and it's just very simple and basic, and you can't really tell where in the world this is. It's almost like a liminal space, and you have these kind of beautiful images of, and you see this woman kind of just laying in the street, uh, beaten up, and just the indifference around here is, is is very, you know, cold but fascinating, open, and then so you, you just have Ramsey just come out of nowhere, kind of kind of splice yeah, right in. Yeah, it's so unfunny. Um, which is very much exactly, I think, 
fitting to his his, his style overall. So he'll ha he'll kind of well, he'll he'll kind of uh, lull you in with these beautiful contemplative moments, and then just hit you over the head with uh, with everything else. Which you know, I like Ramstein, but just the the placement of it is it's very so unexpected and, um, Steven, and, and and abrupt. Stephen, it's kind of like word. what you said about Dark Place. Even though I don't agree, it's kind of like what you said, where it's like, all right, it's bad. Uh, okay. It, like, am I supposed to be impressed? Am I supposed to like your well, movie now? Like, it's okay. not. I it's mean, just bad. Is, there and there's one scene where Stellan's the dark place. Well, yeah, they're going for different things, obviously. But I'm saying about like how you felt towards it in that aspect of it as well. It's right. Yeah. To it. And Stellan, there's a scene where Stellan Skarsgård was like, uh, "Oh, I don't know. That seems like an unbelievable coincidence." First off. That he should have said that like ten times throughout the story. And second off, it's <laughs> yeah. fuck you, fuck you. That just it's so there's so many problems out. with this. Like it's such a cop when out. she when she goes to get abused uh, voluntarily because that's what she's into now. Uh, she leaves her child at home with the door open to the porch while it's snowing outside. Hmm. Who does that? Oh, uh, clearly someone have not you in seen their right mind. The I guess. Opening of Antichrist, oh. Devin. Have you seen the opening oh, of no. Antichrist? That's the I... opening of Antichrist. He just He's ripped off the opening. It's not a homage. It's just the same scene, except the ending's but slightly it's... different. It's the same music. It's very but similarly he's... shot. But it's he's the same playing concept. playing it comedic, where in Antichrist he's playing it serious. Yeah, but why would you I, I didn't take that? that as comedic at all. I didn't That's take it like... as comedic either. <laughs> I'm just like well, it's the the the, the child neglect is something I t I do not take lightly in movies. <laughs> it's why well, would you well, do that? It's comedic if you've seen Antichrist because it, you're watching it because it's so and you're stupid. Thinking, yeah. Oh my god, is he gonna do it again? And then it's like, oh no, he's just fucking with you. Yeah, well, that's just so, playing with expectations. That's take exactly that scene out of right. the movie and what changes? Take that scene out of the movie. What changes? I mean, exactly. <laughs> no, it's like, <laughs> well, I, I will. I, I know we kind of need to move on. I, I did want to just add this one yeah. <laughs> note it's because I movie. thought this was funny. When I was talking about uh, the five obstructions, um, there was a time where Von Trier had pitched this uh, idea that, that he wanted to do this with Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro. Oh, no. And oh, have man. them try to remake Taxi Driver with the same restrictions. And uh, Paul Schrader, who <laughs> we've talked about on the show, uh -huh. uh, was quoted as saying it was a terrible fucking idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> what a chad. Uh, Paul Schrader comes up just as often as Norm MacDonald. They're just... He does indeed. He is a, a favorite of Not the show. Not quite that good. Uh, Absolutely mad lad. Absolute mad lad. Speaking of mad lads, let's review uh, Lars von Trier's uh, Nymphomaniac. Well, let's rate Volume 1 first, you know, to make it easy for Letterboxd. What would you guys give Volume 1 out of 10? Honestly, I would give Volume 1 an 8. I was really um, taken wow. by it, and I, I, I found it very compelling uh, for, for the most like, like for, for the most part. I did find the conversation really fascinating and kind of contrasting these two characters and their lifestyles um just very fascinating and it shows it, it kind of does push the envelope of morality but she's already questioning it herself and he's giving reasons why she's sort of acting in, an, in a more natural way and i did find that really like that conversation really fascinating between them so um this is why I shared the gif uh, after seeing both parts. Uh, they had me in the first half, not going to lie. <laughs> uh, I get that. Well, I will also give part one an eight. Nice. I think mm. it's I think it's good. I, I don't think he's quite found his rhythm until part two. And what would you uh, give for part me? two out of ten? Uh, do, Devin, you want to you wanna go first here? or? Uh, it could have been an eight as well if it weren't for the last fucking minute. Which <laughs> knocks it down to a six point nine. Hey, Ooh. he did it. I told you okay. I was saving it. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give part two a nine. Nice. I think to me that's where it really comes into uh, it, its own sort of von Trierness. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know what? I'm 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 gonna invert 
Devin six point nine. You're gonna give it a nine point six. Hell yeah! I was just about to ask. Like, yeah, yeah that's uh, a perfect opportunity there. Well, yeah, but um, I'll get... yeah, one thing I was Sorry. expecting from from the uh, marketing and everything, and um, that that gave me that there would be some like some big BDSM orgy, which there actually wasn't. So, uh, it maybe that's restraint. I don't know, or lack of restraint, <laughs> considering that that's what I was expecting to see more of in a literal and, sense. Uh... Um, Ian, do you want to do you want to give yeah, me two uh, ratings? <laughs> if you guys, I get a lot of people love movie. these movies. And if you like these movies, that's fine. But I just, I really couldn't get into these, man. And I was really hoping, like, my expectations wouldn't be reached, but somehow got even lower than my low expectations. <laughs> no. uh, up its own bum. His head so far up on this. Uh, up and its loving own, it. I, yeah, his head is so far up in his own ass that it's coming out where his neck should be. I, I never want to see these films again. Like, why would I? They're just even on filmmaking level, it, it's just such a mess, and I couldn't connect with anything that was going on. And yeah, wow. Volume One gets a three point five out of ten because there was some hopes of a good conclusion, and Fun oh, Two completely squandered that, and I'm giving it a two out of ten. Like, I oh hate these movies. I absolutely <laughs> hate them. The the idiots well, has to be pretty fucking bad for, for me to consider well, that so the worst I, movie. I, I will say this. Uh, Mark Kermode once interviewed Von Trier, and oh uh, Kermode jokingly said, I hated the last movie you did. And Von Trier said, yeah, but did you really hate it? <laughs> so I, think that, I think that perfectly sums up uh, what he's about. What a mad oh, yeah. mad. Also, what a Gerald, mad, mad. I wanted to bring up uh, in the Sesame Street counting scene. Uh, <laughs> did you know Stan Skarsgård says for eight instead of eight? Says for eight. And I'm sure yeah, that he was. He starts in... to say five. And then he says eight. And I'm sure that was an intentional decision that added a lot to the film. It wasn't just a editing oversight. Moving on. <laughs> is it an editing oversight, or is he just doing it to piss you off? That's the question. Probably. Make a there, movie. Daryl, uh, if you had to, to give this, uh, if you had to give these films a numerical value out of ten, what would you uh, give *Nymphomaniac*? Uh, probably about an eight and a half for the first one, and a solid six for the second. Just <laughs> yeah, about the same as <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, same kind of vibes uh, that you guys were saying. Just uh, yeah. did not quite land or stick the landing. So. All right. Uh, um, who wants to introduce Devin. Don John? I think Devin was going to introduce it. Oh, yeah. So Don John yeah. is the uh, 2013 film uh, from writer, director, star uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt. Uh, and this is his um, directorial debut. It is about a uh, young man who is uh, full of piss and vinegar, uh, young, dumb, full of cum, uh, all those things. Wow, rude. I mean, come on. Well, no, that's, that's, <laughs> the, 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 these are very common expressions. Like, this is, oh, this understand. is very, just... this is very <laughs> applicable. He loves but, his um, family, yeah, he exactly. loves his car, he loves his house. I love my quib. <laughs> he loves and his he, And he loves his he porn. Loves his He's a sigma male. <laughs> and, 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 and you know what, I think that the, the timing of this film was really interesting, because I was coming up, um, in, in my, uh, development at this time and i think this really uh, hit a raw nerve in terms of uh exposing or diving into a, a real very real phenomenon that like the sensation of watching uh the act is different than doing it and it kind of hits your uh part of your brain differently and there and there is real like addiction that can come out of uh being exposed to it uh so readily um and it does kind of go through this whole it's a very kind of classic story otherwise of boy meets girl but boy has to reconcile with inner demons and then he meets other girl um <laughs> but um i i this was a very welcome film to watch after all five hours of nymphomaniac where it's a very <laughs> concise hour and a half yeah, and right. very exactly. digestible kind of familiar storyline but also does tap into the issue uh, unabashedly um I really enjoyed this one. Yeah. It, I thought it was yeah. fine. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. Like, this film just happened to come around at a good time where I had a fucking miserable day at work. I was feeling like crap. I think this was the day before I got sick on top of everything else. And I just went home, pointed on this movie, and it's like, okay, great, another movie about sex addiction. And it just, <laughs> I don't know, it just put a smile on my face, man. Like, it was 
like really funny. It was pretty solid for a directorial debut. It's it's nothing special. It's kind of a simplistic take on the issue, but I don't think it's it's not trying to be special. Like that's the difference is that it it kind of knows what it is and it just you know sticks to, to an extent at least. There's some yeah, problems I have I mean... with the messaging to an extent, but. For the most part, yeah. I don't know. I just I I had fun with it, man. Maybe it's just I the time I saw it. I think it's fine. I mean, I I think it's I, it feels a little bit forgettable. Like it's a very derivative plot. Yeah, it's a very basic sort of structure. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't actually agree with a lot of the messaging in this film. I, like some of it, I do. Some of it, I don't. Some of it's a little I, hypocritical. Like some parts are definitely oversimplified, and you know there there are elements of his character that I don't jive with, and I would look at well, the issue I differently like... from his perspective. But it, it does feel like a believable type of character. Like, like, like I've seen people like that. Yeah, absolutely. this guy exists somewhere for sure. This guy, a hundred percent exists no, no, somewhere. I, I believe really well. he, I believe he exists. He reminds me of like a Jersey Shore kind of guy yeah like, oh, yeah, guys were, just, well, that, yeah oh. that's the template he's using for the whole yeah structure, and i right? mean i i don't know like i mean i think it's okay i mean it, it's not like you said it's not trying to reinvent the wheel um the thing that i really took issue with and it it there was like one thing that like if i'm if i have to nitpick um it tries to conflate his addiction with Scarlett Johansson's, uh, you know, love of romantic comedies, which I think is a really bizarre false equivalency to make. Really? And I don't uh, I do really. Not. <laughs> I guess. Well, no, well, I. No, because the, the, well, no, the argument is that both of them are, I guess, being like, uh, uh, like they have unrealistic fantasies. Yeah, no, that that these are setting unrealistic expectations. expectations. Yeah, yeah, but they're but... setting unrealistic expectations for different things. Like, it, romance movies are setting unrealistic well, expectations of what no, like a boyfriend or a girlfriend should be. Oh, but it's fine. love at and the end I, of the day. I understand that, and I agree with that, but trying to equate the two when one of them is obviously clearly more destructive... No, I don't think. I think the mistake is it's not equating. Which one? I don't think he ever tries to say it's. I feel like I feel like a pornography addiction is way more destructive to a relationship than some woman who watches romantic comedies. That's Are arguable, sure that? considering look how it affects her relationship and the way she functions in a what is supposed to be like yeah. a, a meeting together. It's not like she sets standards, she sets rules, she sets herself up as this princess that's supposed to be like she implements these ideals upon herself in the same way that he. Okay, it's in it, but again, it's not one to one. I don't think the movie ever says that. I think you I see, think just see an argument where he raises that as a counterpoint. But I don't know if that's yeah. necessarily and that's like a, I think he's saying, well, if you're guilty of this, almost, then you can't it feels throw stones in the glass. It to him. It feels like he's trying to make the point that it's 1-1, one, one, which I don't agree with. Well, he's, I mean, he's able to kind of overcome it, so I wouldn't necessarily... In that moment, sure, but I don't think that's what the movie's saying. That's not what the movie's I saying. I kind of yeah. think the film is trying to say that, that's and I'm, I don't agree with that. The, on, the interesting on... part is that's not the argument I side of the argument i take issue with the side of the argument oh, wow. i take issue with is like it's trying to say like all of these love stories are so generic and predictable and it's the same thing every time it's so redundant i'd argue the film is just as tropey <laughs> and redundant no. as the romance films it's making fun of like that's the part of the argument that bugged mm -hmm. me more than anything just like that hypocrisy of like genre criticism it's, it's the like worst it, the 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 worst yeah. part is hypocrisy. This is almost like the guy version of "Isn't That Romantic?" Did you guys ever see that movie? Yeah, that, it's like that the movie, a fun movie that no, makes I fun of. Not. It's like the movie that makes fun of romantic comedies while also just unabashedly being one. You know, yeah. It's just it's just very like Deadpool esque fourth wall. I feel like they're very uh, wink wink nudge nudging. Yeah. Um, it doesn't do anything otherwise subversive or transformative in the genre it just is that but acknowledges that it is that the whole way uh but in a very i mean it, fourth like, wall breaking kind of sense <laughs> sure but i mean that's not this know. that's that's a different movie entirely. Yeah. Well, no and i understand but like i i, I 
I mean, the movies that Scarlett Johansson is into, they're not, I, 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 I they're not equatable to, equatable, is that a word? Equatable. They're, they're not the same equitable. as, you know, like, they're not affecting her uh, intimacy. Like, like, I mean, this is like, well, okay, but it's not it's not the same it's not point for point and i think and like the because they make a point yeah. that it's like they they make the argument that you know this whole like plot point is that he can't connect with someone he has to like after he you know has an intimate moment he has to go and like watch pornography and and how that destructive that is and and it's just like that's not the same problem that she has you know it's but just I, like, again though I, I i don't think it ever says that because all you're ever seeing is a counterpoint like all he's raising is a point of don't throw stones yeah. in a glass house he's not saying your disease is just or like this is just as bad by any means i think there's examples throughout that do show how it affects her like she's not the main uh, female in the end so they're in a in a weird way it really does balance a 50 50 split on how much we're seeing of julianne more how, versus how much we're seeing of scarjo and yeah you guys are like nailing it and when you're like leaning in terms of like the structural setup but i think a lot about the ending and growth is a comment on this genre because he has literal growth he doesn't have like oh i changed my mind and you know what this guy who is in front of me all along is per like he doesn't have those moments he literally opens up like we see scenes of intimacy that aren't sexual and i think that's what isn't in these movies and that's well, the comment right like he's not trying to like focus on oh this movie's about how that's the same he's just saying in a framework sense like this damages you and like it can have those rippling effects, and that's why that relationship doesn't work. Otherwise, can I, you've built up a perfect. But I do want to raise an interesting match. point about the ending here, because the beginning of the film, he does not have a serious uh, relationship. Like he he's kind of hooking up. He's kind of meaninglessly going from one night stand to one night stand. He's obsessed with porn. You know all of these things, and then by the end of the film, it's like. He, he finds a relationship of some sort with the Julianne Moore character, but their relationship isn't headed toward like marriage. It's not headed towards any. That's the point though. And and no, that's no, why I these, these that, movies what, end what with an unrealistic between, goal. What is the difference between the hookups that he was having in the beginning and just hooking up with uh, Julianne Moore well, on a regular more a basis? Actual it's, it's a more, yeah, they actual actually talk about actual emotion. intimacy <laughs> and actual emotional connection that he's yeah. bonded with, where he's actually honest with himself and honest with her. And it's the scenes that is with her that was also the most arousing for that reason, I found. Just, yeah. you know, personally. Oh, the it's just the fact that he's, actually, oh, yeah. that, that, that he's actually being open in, in, in every facet. And, and that's the, really the ultimate kind of, you and know. She asks yeah. questions about himself, whereas Scarlett Johansson tells him ways he has to be. Like, there's fundamental differences. And don't get me wrong. Like, sorry if I'm getting I, – I just didn't really get a point to get all this out at the beginning. No, no, that's fine. Time. So, like, with me, the film is, like, the reason you guys found it kind of, like, man, passable in my eyes is because it does so much well. Like, its structure, while it is – a thing recognizable it is able to play with that without you necessarily realizing again like i said like it does things like balances two romantics in a way that most movies won't most movies will introduce you know the wrong girl and it's the wrong girl this scene like up until the end when he re-meets her part of me still was like is he just gonna swap back was this all about him growing and going back with scar joe because a yeah, normal that, movie may do that, but that's I what that's what a normal movie would do with Zati. It's yeah. like the second girl was the right girl instead of like I I had a chance with this first girl, then I fucked it up, and then I tried getting up with this other girl, but she's the wrong girl, so I go back to the. That's what most movies do, but in this case, the first one was the quote unquote wrong one. Not to say that there's a wrong or right one, but it yeah. just wasn't working between them. Well, because of the intimacy, like we talked about before, right? Like, I think this movie does a really good job of showing you the perfect example of these wires not crossing. And, like, maybe, and again, not bashing it, but I think that's why you're focusing so much on that interaction, because it's a powerful fucking scene where he does make this equation. But we also got to acknowledge, they have this fight halfway through his growth in art. Do you think he'd be saying those 
same things about easily equating that in the beginning. No, but I think it was an obvious thing to him that, you know, in his mind, he's, he has these fantasies that, you know, it doesn't even need to see be about her, but he has this world he can escape to that, you know, serotonin, serotonin boosts and does all those things in your brain. And she does the same in the movies. It's not that, um, the, the acts are the same or have the same addiction results. It's that like you get, she's like, escaping to this world the way he escapes so why is because he's you know touching himself and there's a physical result any different from the way she builds herself up and now it's a part of the sexual act because this movie puts her in a mood that leads into her false intimacy so it's it's like it's Mm -hmm. literally just showing two kind of blocks of like different like things not fitting together is kind of where I see it from. Sorry, that was my <laughs> spiel. <laughs> so. No, no, I mean, I, I, I understand I, I, what you're saying. I mean, but... I, 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 th- I think you nailed it with that. Uh, that's all yeah. I'll say for now. And uh, we're kind of nitpicking with this aspect, too. Like, there is a lot of genuinely good qualities about the movie. Like, I mentioned earlier, it's a very solid, like, directorial debut. Like, it, it's well shot. The pacing's really good. The comedic timing's great. You're right about the editing being great, but I gotta say, there really should have been a seizure warning <laughs> before the start of the movie oh because there God, were so the many like, oh, yeah, quick yeah, flashes. Yeah, no, that was and, powerful. Yeah, those like Strobus <laughs> drop edits. Yeah. Um, I, I think the performance is really great too. I really love oh, the yeah. fact that Brie Larson was in this and didn't say anything, <laughs> yeah, except for the end. That's a good build Tony up Danza, too. man. I'm not used to Tony Danza acting. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I, I, I like uh, Brie Larson. I think she's a good actress. I mean, I think yeah, she me gets too. a lot of shit for, for Captain Marvel, but it's like, I mean, ScarJo is herself she's a fantastic actress she's fantastic in this she's fantastic in lost in translation Judge but like if you look at her performance as black widow over the years it's not great yeah and well, that's they don't nothing have much to work with her. yeah exactly. that's, yeah that's nothing against her that's just like of course it's not great you know it's it's, it's, the, it's most... the marvel machine yeah i'm glad yeah, you mentioned Tony no. dancer because those are my favorite bits in the movie just the stuff of the family when they're arguing about the tebow it's like oh it's like don't you fucking see that it's like you know if you get the tebow you can bring back what the fuck is a tebow who gives a shit (laughs) this scene sponsored by tebow yeah there's a lot of other subtle brand like placement like i think they mentioned nike at some point oh yeah but he's Um, a person that is about brands right it would make sense to spend a couple years getting those sign-offs and like working them into i think it's a very effective like you said for a directorial debut it does what many don't think about when they enter the directing world and that's what i really mm-hmm. appreciate exactly just, like yeah, if, like if, if you are going to do product product place and it makes sense to have a very materialistic character that actually gives a shit about that stuff and also it pays the bills for the movie so exactly that's yeah. a good balance uh, yeah. between the like, two like uh, have any of you guys seen uh what women want with uh, Mel Gibson. Yeah. Do you know the, the whole conversation they have about Pepsi halfway in the movie? <laughs> ah. Oh, God. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, yes, uh, it, it's. I, I I think it's fine. I mean, I, I think for an independent film, it's, it's pretty damn good. Uh, I, I don't have a lot wrong to. Like, I, I don't have a lot of nitpicks. I do. I almost wish that there was maybe a more effective way to sort of show his uh, addiction affecting him than just these kind of random, like, nom flashbacks where he's like, (laughs) oh, no, I'm thinking about this porn clip, and it cuts to the porn clip. Um, yeah, that was. Well, like, you know, like I, growing I, I, up I and like, breaking his routine, right? Like you have I, I, the whole I, yeah. fight with the punching the glass in. And... Uh, no, I, 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 know, I actually but... like when they splice in like a few frames or a second of it because it's like an obtrusive thought. Like as he's on this date with this girl uh, yeah, and she's great. trying to emotionally yeah. connect, he can't help but think about you know porn. And well, it's and it's, it, it, I mean, it's to, I, to I me that was like an, an obtrusive thought and I thought that that was That's really a good well done. way of showing that. Yeah. It's okay. I mean, I almost wish like I I I think there's maybe a way to make that even more like uh, you know, like maybe like you know, he's like seeing these women like make out on the table or whatever, like really kind of oh, you know, on. That's be too meta much, about it and be like <laughs> 
I think we just or, need to see him jerking off. That's what we need to yeah, see. Yeah, <laughs> where's the NC-17 cut? Because apparently Wait, there is one out Where's the there. money shot? Apparently yeah. there is the NC-17 like, cut. No, that, that, like, that, no, that's no, really, that's really what you wanted out of this kidding. film, yeah. Steven. You wanted to see Joseph. Maybe he goes in the bathroom and like there's there's just like porn happening in front of him. I don't know. It's like, that's you know, the, though. Is it too that, much? I, it I feels so. kind of basic to just cut. It, 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 the, like, it, no, it, it would be needlessly clip. explicit, I think. It, it's I mean, like the Family Guy scene where Quagmire goes to the mall and the women just randomly <laughs> make out in the fountain. Like, that's what that would exactly, well, you mentioned, yes. Rise, But that's so goofy and over the top. It fits in Family Guy because it's a dumb family... Uh, you know, dumb animated <laughs> sitcom. It doesn't really work in this I movie. Don't know, man. <laughs> like Don Chon's a comedy, but it's not that kind of comedy. But I have to admit, <laughs> the sound of the laptop starting up made for some really good comedic timing. <laughs> Cause like oh, every time it comes up, you're like, oh god damn it. <laughs> that's always gonna remind you of that too. Yeah, like years that. on, every time I hear that noise, I still think porn. And it's <laughs> only because yeah. of this movie. Yeah. It's just like oh that yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I don't know, like it, it just caught me on a good day. It just put me in a good mood. And Julian Moore, like she's great in the movie. I thought the scenes of her were kind of corny. Like, it's like, okay, I know where this is going. She's being the middle-aged, wiser woman who's gonna show him a better path, and yeah, that's... She's, and she's, well, not what necessarily. Happens. She gains she's as much from him as he gains from her, like, right? Like, yeah, it's a, I know, but it was still, it, like... The, it, it's no, kind of a simplified the, look at the issue, and again, no, it doesn't bug me that much in this movie because it's kind of silly, but... She's the mommy GF. That's like, this <laughs> is the male... <laughs> that's all Steve needed. Yeah, um... um I think no, there is kind of a good. It's kind of funny though that she's mostly well known for for uh, one of her like biggest performances was Boogie Night. So I think there is some irony in the casting here. Yeah, uh, she's had plenty of sexual experience. Um, oh uh, yeah, it's like I could do a second take. <laughs> Very funny. <fitting. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Uh, right. I like her approach to grief. I will say that much. As as much as it could have been, you know, typical and whatnot. I, I like the way she dealt with those, like the transition from like in a crying mood or like something immediately shook her like that felt more accurate than a, a giant scene where she, you know, leaves class, goes to the bathroom, has to cry. Like it felt Christ like real, America, like, Oh yeah. no, these emotions can just pop. Like, and yeah. And you know, it's still so That's recent, true. like while yeah. she may be ready and to move on and like, just feel touch or like get past that. Like, it's yeah. still like, it's still this burden on her and, and you never really feel that subside and, and kind of, you know, like kind of like Steve said too, I like that it doesn't just end with them being married or a happy ending or a path. Like, I think it's more about just his real transition from a kid that jerks off to a man who is ready for a real relationship. And, you know, we get coming of age stories all the time, but they tend to focus on youth years and like that same derivative story. But like, have you ever seen a movie about like, you know, let's sit down and talk about how much you're masturbating. Like they, they don't exist, right? And I just feel yeah. Hollywood I feel especially. like in that yeah. sense, it may be blah, maybe meh, but I think there's probably some people out there that you know might have needed to see this movie. You know, might have needed. Oh, I agree with that. Yeah, the, the, the C U M M I N G of age stories. <laughs> fucking knew it. In. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say I, I did prefer this film to Shame. Uh, I think this film has a lot more to say than Shame, and and I think it does very well on the budget they had. Switch, um, twitch, twitch, twitch. I, you say it puts never, the other film to shame. Boom! Yes, Boom. you suck. Um, <laughs> Holy I shit! I do want to. I I do want to bring up one kind of aside because this this does fall into uh, something that I've <laughs> that I can go on a rant about. So uh, in the movie, oh yeah, yeah another um, one. Yeah, yeah. So Julianne Moore's character, when she approaches uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's, you know, Don John, um, she hands him a movie, and she makes a statement that this was uh, directed by a Danish woman in the 70s. And so this was actually a real thing. It was like the Swedish erotica series um, in the 1960s and 70s, and these were like cheap VHS porn things. I mean, she's handing him a DVD, but... Um, this was actually before like the Hollywood golden age that you know they talk about in Boogie Nights. But there was these movies that were centered around uh, European sexuality. And so they were often like Swedish or Danish. And uh, there's actually one that was 
a, a documentary about Swedish uh, sexuality that was shot in Italy, or I guess it was like they, they took footage from Sweden and, and they put like this Italian narration over it. And so it was this, <laughs> it's like this big sauna of these uh, Swedish women, uh, Swedish blondes going into the sauna and there's like this Italian guy doing the voiceover and he's, you know, describing, oh, you know, they're getting all sexy or whatever. Anyway, the reason I bring this up is because in this documentary they play a song and the documentary was released which i use documentary loosely i mean this was basically a a, a soft core porn disguised as a documentary about swedish uh, sexuality but this film was released in 1968 and the the song that they play over the swedish models going into the sauna uh is yes and uh oh, nine shit. years later <laughs> that song was used on the muppet show <laughs> in 1977 what the fuck? so <laughs> jim Henson, jim Hansen, a, a man of culture <laughs> why who thinks Menomina. like this belongs in my cute puppet show made for it's like it's i mean what a visionary that too <laughs> yeah a true artist a true cinephile uh, uh, that that may have, that may have been the greatest deep dive to find the sauce oh, i've heard in a while best piece of what, trivia on this podcast yet Holy what crap. a mad lad what a what mad I'm... lad and joseph gordon levitt yeah. is mad lad too uh i don't really have much else to say about this one it's just yeah the messaging could have been better yeah some it does fall apart a little bit towards the second half for me, but I don't know. It just caught me on a good day. It just made me smile after, in a time where I really needed the film to do that for me. And it's well made overall. The performances are great. The road rage was hilarious. <laughs> last second to last road rage moment where he's like, uh, you want to say some shit, you fat fuck? It's a fuck you. <laughs> he just smashes his window. And like, that was, that was great. Like it just, this film made me laugh so much. And, uh, this is an easy 6.9 out of 10 for me, but I don't know about you guys. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Easy. I, I, I was going to go higher with that. Like, I, I was going to give it an 8, uh, unironically. Like, eight. I thought it was a solid movie. Wow. And um, I, I, I could go to a 9.6 just for the meme, but... I'm going 9.6 if you don't. Go for <laughs> it. <laughs> go, go for it. But, um... There, there, there's some other funny things. I love the uh, the fake movie that's in this movie of special someone yes. with Channing Tatum. <laughs> they it, 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 just, it just fits the whole. I think it's was, so I convincing. Think that was Anne Hathaway too. Yeah, yeah. Both oh, yeah. friends of Joseph Gordon-Levitt. It's pretty convincing too. Like honestly, if you've seen a Nicholas Sparks movie, it's it's not bad. Like it's not that far off. Yeah. You'd think wow. it's exaggerated. There's just so many fun tidbits in this film. Yeah, fuck it. I'm gonna give it a nine point six as well. It's just a it's a solid movie. <laughs> wow. Uh, what about uh, you, Stephen? Uh, I'm not gonna go that high, but I I will give this a solid seven and a half out of ten. Nice. Dope. Oh, that's still pretty solid overall. Uh, I think yeah, pretty solid. That was a that was a hell of a discussion. Thank you so much, Daryl, for coming in and leading. Oh, we didn't. Uh, Oh, oh, you gave it six point nine. Okay. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I, I gave it six point nine. Rating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks uh, for having me out, guys. I uh, I hope he directs something else soon because I saw a lot of potential here. I know it was oh. a very niche thing for him, but if he was to direct like yeah. a bigger budget film, I think he could handle it. I think he could pace it well. I I just mm -hmm. I have hopes for him if he returns to direct. Yeah, I I think I saw something that's in development called Wingman, which seems like it's of the same kind of yeah, vein. Yeah, and this. it might be like a musical kind of thing with Channing Tatum, if that's oh. the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> Maybe wow. yeah, he does about have pilots. Nice experience. Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, uh, how fitting. Thank yeah. you so much, guys. It was a very uh, nice discussion, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh, I will see, Before uh, you I will go, see... Stephen, uh, I want yes. to bring up next uh, this upcoming Thursday's episode, which is Femme Fatales. Uh, I was gonna. I want to use this podcast as an opportunity to ask you, Daryl, uh, if you're still listening, uh, Daryl. Yeah, bud. Would you and Jamar like to join us as guests for this oh, episode yeah, of Femme Fatales? We will be talking oh, about Dumbo Indemnity, Sunset Boulevard, and the kind of underrated uh, 
kind of overlooked Last Seduction, starring Linda Fiorentino, I think is how you pronounce her name. Yes. She was kind of big yeah. in the 90s and 80s. I'm... She actually, it, it's funny, she did uh, she did Last Seduction, and then she, uh, <laughs> she did a film called Jade, which is unfortunately not great and it somewhat sabotaged her career it's a rare misfire for uh william friedkin who i love and keep trying to bring up on the podcast but (laughs) doesn't uh, quite pan out yeah well jade is uh jade is an unfortunate film it's the most uh, movie of all time well, it's also written by the guy who wrote Showgirls, so that should uh, that should tell you what you need to know. Maybe <laughs> maybe worth discussing yeah, at some point. Potentially, but eventually. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Then, uh, stay tuned for Conan, and uh, is it first day yet? Have a great night, Uh-oh. guys. All right, Good night, everybody. everybody say nice all at once. One nice. Two, it, nice. <laughs> we fucked up. <laughs> that was nice.